right, let's, let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we come before you today, we simply ask that the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, Holy Spirit, you are definitely welcome in this place. And we realize apart from you, we can't do anything. And we ask you to teach us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear the engrafted Word of God so that our minds will be renewed, that we may grow and we may fulfill and continue to do the will of God in our lives. We just ask you to help us to give us spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge as we listen to your Word today, as we study your Word. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. We've been, uh, of course, doing a series on speaking of the real issues of life, and as I've been praying over each and every Sunday over uh, the messages that God has given me and put put within my heart, one of the things that I, I began to realize that one of the real issues that is happening right now across America, there has been uh, a great heightened, heightened awareness of the last days, the, the days that we're living in, the, what's called the end times. And there's a lot of people that are asking a lot of questions because they're seeing so much that are go- that's going on uh, today. Matter of fact, there was a, a report on one news agency that uh, did a poll uh, concerning talking about end time last days. Now, this is a this is a secular news organization. It's not a Christian organization. They, they've just seen all of the curiosity, and so they decided to do a poll. And um, when they did the poll, they found out that 84% of Americans that they polled are very interested in understanding what is happening, what are the signs, what does the Bible say about the last days. The one thing that God really put upon my heart as I was beginning to study and read some of these things, he pointed out two areas concerning the church, concerning the body of Christ, that you and I have to be very aware of, or literally it could cripple us, wound us, and take us out of these days that we're living in for us to be effective and for us to be productive in our life. Now, he's speaking of the awareness of the last days. If you just, can, if you just look if anything on television, you can see all of the, the areas that Jesus was talking about. Uh, you can see the areas that, that he discussed concerning the signs, uh, the seasons that we're living in. Nobody knows the day or the hour when Jesus Christ will come back and return. But the Apostle Paul said that we should not be ignorant of the signs and we should not be ignorant of the seasons that we're living in Uh, according to the Word of God, about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, on November the 7th, something is happening uh, that uh, a world-renowned evangelist is going to address the whole, the United States, but this this is going to be put on around the world. And what's what's incredible about this is that this evangelist, who is a well-known, respected evangelist, But at the same time, we have something happening here that's totally, completely different. And that is this. This message that he will bring, he has said, will be his last message to America. Because he's 94 years old. And of course, his name, and you you know the name, his name is Billy Graham. And on November the 7th, what is unusual about this is not only Christian networks going to be carrying what he's getting ready to say in his message, but... News networks, Fox News, NBC, CBS, news networks are carrying this. Now, let me ask you this. What, when, when, you, when you think about that, you think about that is happening. When is the last time you've ever seen that happen? There, it hasn't. So, to me, it is God saying, hello, I'm speaking, I'm getting ready to say something. Now, one of the saddest things to me is this. Why did God have to choose a man who can't even really stand up, 94 years old, hard, it's hard for him to speak. I was praying and I was saying, God, I mean, why, 
I, I mean, you've got so many young preachers, evangelists, that are pastors, world-renowned pastors. Why, why do you have to go to a 94-year-old man? To me, it was like this. He's the only one that will actually tell what God wants to say. You know, so many people today, so many people today don't want to offend anybody. So many people today want to, to, to water everything down and make it sound so positive. And the Word of God is positive. Matter of fact, the gospel is good news. It is. But there are times when God says, there are some things going on that I need to address. And people need to hear. And I need somebody that will speak it and speak the truth and not water it down. But speak it the way I want it to speak. Now, you know, Dr. Graham will bring a wonderful, positive, incredible message, but he's also bringing a warning to the United States of America. And like I said, it's going to be on, on November the 7th. But, listen to this, just recently, when, when uh, uh, Israeli's prime minister addressed the United Nations, you know what one of his statements was? He made this statement, he said, to the United States, to, I mean to the United Nations, General Simi, he stood as he addressed them, he said, biblical prophecies are now being realized. That's, he's never said that before. And then, just recently, on the floor of the House of Representatives, Representative Michelle Bachman of Minnesota claimed the world has entered the last days. She said here, quote, this is what she said, when you see up is down and right is wrong, when this is happening, we were told this, that these days would be as the days of Noah. Now, Jesus, in Matthew the 24th chapter, gave us some specifics. He gave us signs. And when the disciples were asking him, they asked him two things. So when Jesus is addressing their question, there's two, question, there's two aspects of that question that he's addressing. One is his coming, his, first, his, his coming, when he will come again. And the other is the signs of the times of the end of the age. Let me read this to you. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 24, beginning with verse 3, please. That's great. We shout for the Word of God, and I'm going to tell you, I can't wait to tell the 830 service y'all beat him this time. Good job. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Jesus... Is sitting on the Mount of Olives, it says the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be, now watch this, two different questions. And what will be, number one, the sign of your coming, and number two, the end of the age? Jesus answered them and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. So, so he's actually kind of going to weave in and out the answer to both these questions, Okay. The thing that I, I'm looking at right now is his return because I believe he's coming back for his church before the wrath of God is poured out upon this earth in what we know as the great tribulation. And so he says this, Jesus answered them, he said, take heed that no one deceives you. Now first and foremost, you have to understand that the first thing he addresses is deception. So if the first thing he says is deception, there's going, must be a lot of deception that is going to be taking place. And of course, again, we, we see that. He, he says there will be false teachers, there will be false prophets, there will be false doctrine uh, that is coming. That's the reason we renew our mind. That's the reason that so many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you show up on Wednesday night uh, for the discipleship classes to renew your mind so that you'll have that foundation so that when somebody comes and brings something to you that is not of God but is deceptive, automatically you will have a relationship not only with the Holy Spirit but with the Word of God and you will immediately know red flags will go up and say something's wrong with that. Something's not right with that. I don't find that in the Bible. Okay? So Jesus said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many and you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all of these things must come to pass. The reason he said see that you're not troubled because he says I'm telling you these things. So don't let these things catch you off guard. I'm telling you it's going to happen. So don't start freaking out. 
you know, when, when you see these. He said, it's here, I'm giving you to it in the Word. He said, and of course we're seeing this right now, uh, just all over the Middle East and all over the world. He said, nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. The, the, the word, the, that, that statement, the beginning of sorrows, means this is the beginning of birth pains. Now every woman in here that, that has had a baby, you understand exactly what it means for the beginning of birth pains. There's getting ready to be a transition. There's a birth that is coming. So Jesus said the transition and the birthing that is coming is going gonna, is gonna to usher in and there's coming a brand new time, a, uh, an event that's going to take place in history. This is coming into the return of Jesus and the end of the age. And so he said, so, so he said, they will deliver you up for tribulation. They will kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and will betray one another and hate one another. Then many prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, and the word lawlessness there means, actually means sin. And because sin will abound, the love of many... The love of many. Now, in the Amplified Bible, it says this. It says, the love of the great body will grow cold. The love of many, he's speaking not of the world. Because the world without Jesus don't even really know what love is. You don't understand love and you won't know what love is until Jesus comes to live on the inside of you. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. Now, the reason we know that it's not talking about the world, is because the word love there in the Greek is the word agapio. It's the same word as agape. It's the same word that says God is agape. God is love. It is the love of Almighty God. You can't know and have the love of God unless you've been born again. So he's talking about the agape love, the love of God. And the love for God, which means the love for one another, through God, by the Spirit of God. He said, because lawlessness will abound, it is going to grow and increase. And we're seeing it all around. I mean, we, we know, we, we are now living in a violent nation. Right here in our own nation. Our streets, the violence, every, everything. I mean, somebody, you know, just walks in L.A. airport. And just and, and, and they're mad at the TSA. And, and so they shoot, blow people away, and then this young man loses his own life. But this is, we're, this is becoming a common occurrence that we see that's going on in our nation right now. He said, the love of many will grow cold, which means that the love of Jesus inside the church will begin to grow cold. Then he says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now let me just say this. I believe in eternal security. I believe that when you are truly born again and you are saved, you are secure in Christ Jesus. You are there, okay? But yet at the same time, I see areas in the Bible where it talks about folks that walk away from their Christianity, don't want to have anything to do with the Lord anymore, start living in a lifestyle that is contrary to the way God has told us that He wants us to live and how the Holy Spirit wants us to live, which means that I will then grieve the Holy Spirit. And if I continue to live like that, I literally can quench the Holy Spirit uh, in my life. And so I don't want to find out how far you can push the envelope. Before I found out that Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You who work iniquity. Okay? I, I, don't, I don't want to find out that. Matter of fact, I believe when you get saved, you have a passion and a desire to become more and more conformed to the image of Christ. You want to be more and more like Jesus. You want to be more and more as a representative to the whole human race of who the Father is, just like Jesus when he was representing him here. And it's very dangerous to be a hypocritical Christian. What is a hypocritical Christian? That is a Christian that puts on their Sunday clothes, comes, worships God, but when they get outside, they're living something totally, completely opposite and different in the way that they are here on Sunday morning. That's being a hypocrite. 
Uh, in other words, I'm projecting a lifestyle that is totally contrary to the life that God wants me to live. So people can't tell me, they can't tell if there's a difference between me and, and people that are saved or not saved. Okay? The last thing I want to hear when I, was, uh, when I would be at work is to somebody walk up to me and say, uh, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Really? You are. And so, therefore, our lifestyle should be a direct reflection of Jesus Christ. Now, let me, let me, let me preface this. Let me just say this, okay? When we get saved, we're not perfect. Inside, you're hooked up with the Spirit of God. So inside, the Bible says, the Bible says you're complete in Him. But I live in this flesh. I still got a mind that's been educated according to the world system and according to my five senses. Not to walk in faith and live by faith. So therefore, I have to re-educate myself. It's called the renewing of the mind. But the Bible tells me not to be conformed any longer to the world because that's not who I am anymore. And so, therefore, it be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I must renew my mind so that I can, can think like God. I will act like He wants me to act, live the way He wants me to live. Now, it, that is a process. Again, that's the reason so many of you are coming to discipleship classes. It's a process. And in that process, I will make mistakes. You know, I will do things and have goof-ups, you know, but... Because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of me, because I'm renewing my mind, because I love Jesus, then when I do it, I recognize that I've done it. I recognize that, I, I, that that's not pleasing to God, that grieves the Holy Spirit. I'll repent of that and, and, and ask God to help me. But at the same time, the more I renew my mind, the more I'm in church listening to the Word, then the more I'm going to be acting different than I was before I was saved. And it's a process of learning there, okay? But here's the reason I'm telling you concerning the issue concerning eternal security. You are secure in Him. But if there was not a possibility for you to walk away from that and to walk out of it, you, you, you make the choice, not God, but we make the choice, then here's my question. If you can never, ever Walk away from that. You could go out and live a life and do anything you want to live, do whatever you want to do, smoke dope, drunk, shack up, do whatever, just live a life you want to do. Because I got saved one day, everything is great. Here's the key. You cannot come to Jesus and say, take my sin, but I want to have my life. I want you to have my sin, but I want to live my life. Oh, I'll live it for you up to a certain point. No, no, no. You can't do that. You, 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 th- that's not salvation. Because a lot of people say, I want Jesus to be my Savior. Well, for that to happen, first he's got to be your Lord. There's no place in the Bible. You can look it up and, and study it out. But there's no place in the Bible that tells you to confess Jesus as your Savior. He says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord you shall be saved. So Lord equates to Savior. Okay? Now, that means that I submit myself to Him. So there's a lot of people who come and mentally assent because they want to go to heaven, but in their heart, they have not given their whole heart to the Lord. And so, and, 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 and so they kind of manipulate and, and kind of live the life they want to live and do the things that they want to do and just think that because they're under the grace of God that everything is fine and, 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 and all is well. That can be a dangerous, deceptive place to be in. Now let me, now, now watch this. If that was not possible, if that was not possible, then Jesus would have never put what he just put and said in here because he'd be contradicting himself. What did he say? And this is all through the book of Revelation, by the way. He said this, But he who endures, perseveres, holds out to the end, shall be saved. That means when I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, as Lord and Savior, I am saved. And then I live and walk this life 
as I learn to listen to the Spirit of God as God wants me to live it. Amen? And, of course, in this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end, taken at the end now, will come. Now, here's two things that I want you to really look at. It's very, so vitally important in your life. There's two areas here that the devil is going to use in the last days before the return of Jesus to get your focus off of where you're supposed to be going, what you're supposed to be doing, and you focusing on who you are as a born-again believer. Verse 10, number one, he puts this in order. He says, and many, the word many again means the multitude, the majority. And many will be offended and will betray one another and literally will hate one another. Offense. Taking offense. That's the thing that you and I have to be careful. That's what you and I have to be careful. You and I have to be careful about offense. Jesus is saying at the end of time, in the last days, before Jesus returns, offense will be at an all-time high. Okay? Now, you can be offended at any point, at any time, at any moment. You you. You can be offended suddenly without even knowing it. It can come upon you, something can happen, and bam, you are offended. And when you get offended, you will get angry. You will get irritated. You will get mad, and you will get upset. And if you're not careful, if you allow the offense to continue to grow, and you take that offense and you nurture it, and you nurse it, it will grow. And it can grow into full-blown unforgiveness. Because when somebody offends you, think about it, offends you, it's like, hey, this is me. Do you know who this is? You just offended me. I mean, just the other day, I was offended. I'm, I was pulling out, getting ready to go on 295. And I looked, and this car speeding up, and there's two great big yield signs that says this car is supposed to yield. Well, I'm seeing this car speed up. Well, bless God, this is my lane. I'm supposed to be in it, and so therefore, I'm going to speed up because I'm in the right. And automatically, just the fact that this car is speeding up is offending me. And sure enough, this car, I get right here, this car just zoom, like this. And the guy turns and looks at me like I have done something wrong and as if I broke the law. Are you serious? I wanted to go take a picture and snap it and chase him down. And put it right in his face and say, did you not see that? I'm telling you, the old owl. You know the one that's crucified with Christ? You know the one that's been buried? I'm going to tell you, that sucker, he came off the cross, rose from the dead, Everything in me (laughs) was going back to the, I'm telling you, the old man said, I'll handle this. Let me take over from here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He'll talk to you. Now, I know that as I'm doing this message, I know that many of you are saying right now to yourself, I know somebody who needs to be in here to hear this. I know you're sitting there going, I cannot believe they're not here today. 
I can't believe that they're not here today. They need to be here today. Because I know this pertains to nobody in here at all. Listen to what Jesus said in John 17, 1. John 17, 1, he says, it's impossible. It's impossible that offenses don't come. The only place there's not offenses is in heaven. And we're not there yet. <laughs> but as long as we live in this earth and there are people here, and there's a devil here, we are going to be offended. It's going to happen. Turn your neighbor and say, it's impossible that it doesn't happen. You know, there are people that are even offended with God. You realize that? When things happen in our life that we don't expect to happen, we get offended at God. We get mad at God. I've had people look at me and say, don't talk to me about God. I don't want to, don't say a word to me about God. They get offended because they think that God answers prayers for everybody else, but, you know, they, they, he has his special, he has his, uh, his favorites, and he, he won't do the same thing he, he did for Pastor Al or somebody else that he will do for me. And they, you look, somebody say, well, they, they're, they're always getting their prayers answered. They're always blessed. I, I'm sick and tired of coming to church and listening to everybody have a testimony. I'm praying and believing and walking in faith. And when is this going to come? When is this going to happen? And then people get offended and they get offended because, God, why did you allow that to happen? Here's where we have to understand that in this world we have choices. Okay? God had nothing to do with that young man walking to L.A. airport. He made the choice by either listening to voices or, or somebody filling his mind full of hatred. Somehow, he got offended to the point that hate came into this. And he got offended to such a level that he literally began to meditate in how that he could get his own revenge, even if it would cost him his life. You know, when people act like that, the one thing that we forget about is we forget about we have family. We forget about that it could be that, that we have children that, that are involved in this. That we have family. That a mom and dad is literally going to have their heart broken. Because somebody was offended and they go into a rage and anger and they're irritated. And, and, and all of a sudden, instead of, instead of dealing with that offense, it continues to build and build and build and build. I'll never forget that when we were in Dallas... Um, we were coming home one, uh, we, we'd been at church late. We had all four kids uh, at that time. With, no, 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 wait a minute. Cameron was not born. We had, we had three of our kids with us, and we were coming home. It was it's sort of late, and, and, and we lived in a little place called Capel at that time. And there was a two-lane road that, that uh, went from uh, Carrollton uh, over to Capel. So we were taking that two-lane road, and uh, I pulled up behind this van, and it was a van that had curtains and things in it, and the windows were tinted. And I pulled up behind this van. The van was going like 35 miles an hour. It was a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm sure they're going to speed up. So I, you know, and it's quite, it's quite a long drive uh, to, from Carrollton to Capel. So I'm sitting there, and I said, well, they're, evidently they're not going to speed up at all. So I pulled out. Not fast, but just pulled out and started to pass. Well, when I started to pass, they sped up. And they kept on going, and so I, I sped up, and they sped up even more. In other words, they were intended for me not to get in. You know, and now I look, and I see a car coming. So then I let off the gas to get back behind them, and they slowed up at the same time intentionally and I'm sitting there going this is crazy now that was 20 years ago when I was working out on a regular basis and I was in good shape <laughs> yeah and I mean I was mad I mean I am now totally offended to the top of the Empire State Building. 
I mean, it is, and I'm, my kids are in the back seat. I mean, you can mess with me, I can get it, but you're not going to mess my wife and my kids. I am now mad, I am upset, I am irritated, and th- that's it. And so I slam on brakes and got behind this van. Well, when you come up to the intersection where you turn off to the right to go into Capel, where we live, it goes from a two-lane, and there's several lanes there that you can go to left or right or, or, or go, go straight. So where we turned off, I knew that I was going to turn off, and we were going to pull up, and there's a stoplight there. And we pulled up to the stoplight, and the stoplight was red. And when I saw it was red, I said, good, this is a good thing. I'm glad this stoplight is red. And so, so when that stop, well, I am seething on the inside. So when that stop, and when that light turned red, and that van came to a stop, and I pulled up beside it, I looked. I couldn't see anything. I opened my driver's door. I stepped out, and I was going to took, put my hand and put it on that van, and whoever was in there, I was going to jerk out. And either one, one of us were, one of us were going to get relief. I didn't know which one it was, but somebody was going to pay a price for what they did. And so, and, and so I reach out, and I get ready to put my hand on that door, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me as loud in my ears as I'm hearing myself right now in these monitors. And the Holy Spirit said, if you open that door, there's a gun there, you're going to get killed. Get back in your car and go to your house. And I went... And I stood there. Remember, Tava, I just stood there for, for a minute. I just stood there for just a moment because it was such a shock. The van didn't move. The light turned green. The van stayed right there. I'm convinced in my heart that somebody was on that back road doing this intentionally. And I am convinced that if I would have opened that sliding door in there, there would have probably been a shotgun or something that would have taken me out. My children would have lost their dad. My wife would have lost her husband. My, my family and Cameron would have never been here. That's the worst thing of all. Cameron wouldn't have been here. Bless his heart. Thank Man, he's still been up there. <laughs> um, but... I got back in my car. I was literally shaking. And I got back in my car, and we drove up to the house. And the, and, the, and the Lord, as we were driving up, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, son, he said, offense is going to happen. And people are going to offend you. And if you're not careful, you being offended and act, acting off your offense can get you killed and get you out of fulfilling the destiny and the purpose that I had for you. He said, offense is made to make you lose your focus. It is made to get you angry and upset. That's the reason that the Bible gives us the definition of offense. The definition of offense is the word scandalon. Scandalon. One of the definitions of scandalon is this. The bait put on a trap. Every one of you understand that if you, you got a mouse trap, you put bait there. Or if you just got a trap out in the woods or you're trapping something and you open it up, you've got to have some bait there. And the animal comes up to take the bait and bam, the trap closes. And... You've got your prey. You've got, you've got what you wanted that particular time. And so offense, according to the definition, offense has to do with a bait that is set in a trap to hurt us, to wound us, to, to inflict pain upon us. That's what offense is, is all about. And so many times people will offend us and they don't even know they've offended us. Have no idea they offended us. And so, so in understanding and knowing that offense is going to come, think about the ways that you can be offended. 
Oh, I, I, I put down a whole list here. You can be offended at yourself. You literally can do something and say, you're so stupid, how can you do it? And you can be mad at yourself. Mad to the point at yourself that you take yourself out of everything. You can get offended that you made mistakes or you failed at something and you'll never try it again. You'll, 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 never, uh, 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 you'll never volunteer for anything. You'll never put you, because you're so offended at yourself and you, you, you put yourself in a position and place that you think that I can't do anything right. You know what that is? You're offended at yourself. So I'm not going to do this anymore. Sometimes you get offended and you'll put walls up where nobody can get to you. You put your walls up where you won't trust anybody because you've been offended by somebody. You can get offended. All right, you ready for this? You can get offended at the government. Hello. You hear all the moans going on in this place right now? You can get offended at the government. You can get offended when trouble shows up. You can get offended at drivers on the road. You can get offended at your boss or your supervisor. You can get offended at policies. You can literally get offended when people bring you in to correct you and talk to you. You can get offended. And you can throw up those walls and get so offended and, and, and they're trying to, to talk to you about certain things. And instead of you saying, gosh, really? Is that what I'm doing? I, I really didn't even know I was doing that. Yes, you, this is the way you act. This is the way you do and things like that. Uh, wow, I am so sorry. Now you, you can sit there and say, I don't receive that in the name of Jesus. You don't talk to me like that. Who do you think you are? I don't receive that. You know, now, now, why, now listen to me, why do you not receive it? Because you are offended. You're offended because you don't want to do it anybody else's way. You don't want to be corrected because correcting to us at times if somebody corrects us, it, it, we, we look at that and, and just say, who do you think you are? I know more than you do. I'm smarter than you are. I know. Especially, I'm going I'm to tell you, it, it, it comes when, especially when you're trying to deal with people at, a lot of times at church. And here's the one thing that people that are offended always use at church. Well, God told me to do this. <laughs> now you're blaming it on God. And, and, and if you could hear God, if God, God said, I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> That's not me. You're the one that made that choice. Don't bring me into this right now. You know, so... so it is amazing how, are y'all seeing this? How you, you can get offended. You can get offended at people who work at stores. You can get offended today when you leave this place and you go and the waitress forgets to come and fill your tea glass up or your water glass up. And you can be offended. You can be offended. Hey, 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 hey! Bless God, this is the worst service I've ever had. I'm not tipping her nothing. <laughs> not giving her nothing. I've never been treated. I can't believe, praise the Lord, hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> One thing I'm going to leave is a track. <laughs> you, can get, you can get offended at a gas pump. You can pull up and you look and you get ready to punt and the gas has gone up. You didn't even look at the, at the marquee and you look at the gas pump. What? How in the world does this gas get up there? I can't believe the gas is up there like this. I can't believe it. I didn't even know. Just the other day it was three and it's 10 cent. The gas pump didn't have anything to do with it. You... <laughs> You can be offended with store prices. You can get offended with your spouse or your children. A person who is obsessed with controlling everything and everyone gets offended often if he or she doesn't get their way. Selfish people can be easily offended. People driven by pride and ego 
and selfish ambition can be offended. Young people can get offended at parents when they give them rules, regulations, or tell them, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to hang out with them. I don't want you to do this. All of a sudden, there is offense that comes up. Having to do chores at home, like cleaning your room. <laughs> you <laughs> Go point them out, Cameron. They're back there somewhere. <laughs> Don't get offended, Cameron. Um, people, listen to this. People can get offended at the prosperity of others. People can get offended at the success of others. People can literally get offended at a praise report on something they've been believing God for. And that person who was a brand new Christian and hadn't been born again but, but two weeks. And you've been walking with Jesus for ten years. <laughs> That's great. And somebody, you can go out and eat with somebody and say, what, wasn't that testimony great? Mm, yeah. That was awesome. It's really good. Praise the Lord. You can get offended when you come into church. You can get offended at one of the parking lot attendants who forgot which, which row of cars he's supposed to let out and let the row out that just got there and you've been sitting there the whole time. And they let them... Did you see what they just did? They just let this roll out over there. I can't believe it. What is this? Hey, hey, hey. Roll down your window. I mean, listen, I'm the pastor. <laughs> we have a security guard here. And usually Tave and I are here a little bit after everybody else leaves and stuff, but there's still people getting out in the parking lot. And Right over here, there they have the cones up, and usually we used to be able to, when we got ready to leave, we would pull out, they would let us out of the cones. Some of the pastor. <laughs> they let us, they let us out of the cones. Well, Mr. Ed, I'm not talking about the talking horse. I'm talking about Mr. Ed back there. Mr. Ed is standing there at the calls, and I come driving up. I've been preaching two services. I come driving up and, and get ready to go out, and Mr. Ed's standing there. I'm going, I'm going. So, so Tave and I had to go around and get in the line. At first, I wanted to fire Ed. <laughs> Why? Yeah, Tavid was interceding. <laughs> I was like, what is the deal here? You know, and so we got in line, and it was wonderful when we got in line. So then I got to see everybody else who was offended. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing the things that happen that what? offend us it's incredible I, I mean you just look around it can be anything I mean just, just think about this when when uh, when a young man and young woman get married they've okay they've been seeing one one another but they haven't been living with one another because you're not supposed to do that 
Amen? That's something special about that night. And uh, so when they, all of a sudden, the young man, like me when I got married, you're used to doing things the way you want to do them. And now you're living with somebody who maybe doesn't do everything the way you thought that they are supposed to do them. But yet at the same time, you thought you married the perfect person. Can do no wrong. Everything is wonderful, great. Because you're in love. It's wonderful. And then you come off the honeymoon. Everything is great. And then all of a sudden you find out you have two totally different personalities. One loves is like an extrovert. Yeah, I'll be around people. The other is an introvert. I don't want to be around nobody. <laughs> One believes in the toilet paper coming out from the bottom. The other believes in the toilet paper coming out from the top. You think I'm kidding. You have no idea what we counsel with. And you go in the bathroom and say, who put this on the bottom? I've got to change it and put it on the top. And the wife will come in and say, what did you put that on the top for? Well, anybody knows, got any sense, knows you pull it from the top, not from the bottom. See, or, see right now, there's already strife starting in here right now. See? People are getting, getting offended right now. See? And, 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 and Tava would tell me at times... Okay, honey, please do the dishes. Put them in the dishwasher. Okay, okay, okay. I just put things in the dishwasher where I think they need to go in the dishwasher. But table would come back through the kitchen and look. No, you can't put that here. You got it. It, 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 it. The object is just to get it clean, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter how you put it in there. I mean, I know it looked weird and awkward in the way things were piled up, but it fit. No, we can't do it like that. We've got to do it like this. I don't know why you've got to do it like that. The only thing we're having to do is just get it clean. If it gets clean, it's fine. <laughs> we are all different. And we are all unique. And we all have different ways of doing things and saying things. If somebody comes in to around our family, our family is very boisterous, very loud, and yeah, <laughs> and we we laugh a lot, we joke a lot, we we kind of put jabs at one another and play, you know, in those particular areas. And some people who come around us are like, they don't know how to handle this. Which brings me to another point, and that is this. Jesus said it's impossible that you're not going to get offended, right? But it also, the Bible tells us, let's don't be one who brings offense to others all the time. That could be a stumbling block. The Bible says that Jesus is a stumbling block and a rock of offense, People get offended by the name of Jesus. No other religion, just the name of Jesus. Because that's the only name that has power to get people saved. And so people want to take this rock and get it out of the way. So they will say, okay, let's get prayer out of school because prayer offends me. I don't like you praying. Prayer offends me. I want you to take those Ten Commandments down because that offends me. I don't want you to pray in that name or use that name. If you want to talk about God, that's fine. But don't pray and use the name of Jesus. You can't do that. That may offend somebody. And so the, the whole point of that is to move this and get it out of the way. That's the reason that people get offended at the Word of God. They, they, they literally will get offended and not even come back to church. And the reason they get offended is because, no, I like this part of my life. I like this lifestyle. I like doing this. And every time I come to that church, I get convicted. And when I get convicted, if I don't humble myself before God and before His Word and say, Lord, if that's the way I am, Father, forgive me and help me 
to be the person I need to be and help me in this particular area of my life. Because the Word of God is going to change us. See, the Bible says that either I can fall on the rock or the rock will fall on me. I want to, I want to fall on the rock. God, help me. Lord, show me what to do. I humble myself. Okay? But a lot of times it's not the big rocks. In our marriages, a lot of times there is, we, we offend one another at times. That, beca- that is a big rock. But there's also there's the little rocks, just the little ones. The other day, when we were going to the state fair, we were walking. Everybody was in a hurry. Everybody's going. I got one of these things in my shoe. I don't know how these things get from the ground into the shoe. I think it's the devil. I watch this. Anyway, I get one in my shoe, and so I'm walking like this, and I'm trying to move it around. You know, like somehow it's going to disappear, somehow it's going to get out, and you're trying to, and you're trying to move it around. But the fact is that as you move it around, it's an irritation. Now watch this. When it becomes an irritation, it causes you to lose focus on where you're going. When it becomes an irritation, if you're, not, if you're not careful because it was irritating me, and now I was getting mad. I was trying to move it around. And, and, and I'm still carrying it. And finally, I got it positioned where it didn't hurt that much, and I was like, oh, okay. So now I'm walking, but then it worked its way back in there. And now it's really beginning to hurt me, and it's beginning to wound me because... The, the side that got into the, to the bottom on the side of my foot, now it, that thing is sharp and it's beginning to stick in me and beginning to wound me and now it's beginning to hurt. So I had to stop everything I was doing to get it out, even though I was trying to carry it for a period of time. See, when offense comes, it's going to be first an irritant. It's going to stir you up. It's going to stir the flesh up. It's going to make you mad. It's going to get you upset. Your flesh is going to respond to offense. It will respond just about every single time unless you spend a lot of time in prayer and a lot of time in, prayer, in, 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 uh, uh, in the Word. I spend a lot of time in places I go in my car, whatever, I spend a lot of time praying in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit. Pray, praying in my prayer language that God has given me the power of the Holy Spirit. I do that because in ministry, you can get offended very easily. I mean, there are times that I'm preaching that I'll, I'll see people get up and walk out because they don't like what I'm preaching. I could get offended at that. I could say, ushers, lock the back doors. Don't you let that guy out. <laughs> of course, I'm not going to do that. But it used to, when we were in a smaller church and people would leave, I would get offended. Like, what's wrong with me? What's what's, what's going on with me? And then I would become offended with them. And so I had to learn over a period of time in my own life that when offense comes, and it is going to come, I've got to learn to deal with it immediately. The more I live and walk in the flesh instead of the Spirit... I'll let that thing hang around. I mean, if, you're, if, if, if you don't know how to deal with this in the, with the Spirit of God, I'm going to tell you, you can let it hang around long enough to name it and give it your address. And if you're, if you're not careful, you will nurse that offense. You will allow that fence to grow and to grow, and to the point that it literally becomes unforgiveness. When offense first comes, it doesn't immediately get over into unforgiveness, but if you allow it to stay, and you don't deal with it, all of a sudden you're going to find yourself into unforgiveness, and you can hate that person. And now, once you allow offense to run its course in your life, 
It literally begins to release. This is medically proven. We have medical doctors in here that could come up and testify concerning this, but, but you can pull it up on the Internet. It is medically proven that when you become offended and you carry the offense and you allow offense to grow where it literally it comes into a place that's affecting your whole life, it releases toxins in your body that becomes poisonous. You can, you can contract diseases based off offense and unforgiveness over a period of time. You can have a hardened heart. You, you can get to the place that, that for some reason you believe that if you hold on to that, that somehow it's going to get back to that other person. It's going to get that other person. No, it's not. Uh-uh. While you're offended and you're sitting there harboring all of this stuff, they're out there partying. They're out there having a good time. They're going out about their business. And you're so mad and you're so upset about what they're doing and how somebody's hurt you and what they've said. You know, offense is going to come. Wounds are going to come. Words are going to come. Actions are going to come that offend you. You've got to be able to know how to deal with it. What the Bible says, Jesus says, take no offense. What does that mean? That means offense is going to come. You're the one that chooses if you're going to take it. You're the one that chooses that you're going to harbor this and nurse it. Or you can do this. You can say, Father, I have no idea what's going on in their life. I don't know what's happening I don't know why that guy almost ran me off the road, but I choose to forgive them. I don't know why they said that to me. I don't know why they did it, but I choose to forgive them. I choose to release them. I choose not to take this offense. I'm not, I'm not going to let it be in my life. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to let it destroy my life. I'm not going to let it become anger and wrath. Because once it becomes anger and wrath, you're going to look for revenge. You're going to be looking for somehow and hoping somewhere that person's going to get hurt. Let me ask you this. You ever thought about this? First of all, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. His disciples fell asleep when he needed them to pray. You ever get offended when you need somebody? You need somebody to be there for you? You need somebody to help you? You're counting on somebody and all of a sudden they don't show up and they're not there? You can get offended so easily. You can get offended at them and so mad that all of a sudden it's going to be World War III. You can get so mad at them. And then there's an explosion. And, and the other thing that happens with offense is this. You don't immediately explode. Because of, offense is not something when it starts out that's going to put you into a rage. It's not until after you start meditating on the offense. And then what happens is you implode first in here, mad, upset. You start making plans. You say things to people. And then you explode. And in the, in the wake of your explosion, people are hurt. Things happen. Why? Because I'm offended. I'm upset. You can carry offense to the place that it literally becomes unforgiveness in such a manner, in such a way, that you literally will hold on to that and will never let it go. And it's destroying your life. It's causing you to be sick and afflicted arthritis, cancer, all kinds of things can begin to manifest. And then the other thing is, when you're offended and you're mad at somebody and you, you get to the place that you don't like them anymore and you hold on to this, things begin to start happening in your life and the fact is that you come down now for prayer but nothing happens. 
And you can't understand why nothing is happening. Why, why, am, why, why am I not getting the benefits of the prayer? Why do other people, things happen, but all of a sudden, I'm not seeing any results of my prayer or if somebody's praying for me. It's because the Bible says when you stand praying, if you have anything against your brother or against anybody else, you are to forgive them. And then your heavenly Father will forgive you. And then your prayers will be answered. It is... It's a catastrophe. It is so unproductive for you to carry offense. I know that there's, there, there are people in here that have been divorced. I know there's people in here right now that are separated. Other things have happened to them. But I want to tell you this right now. You can't carry the offense of what somebody has done and, so, and something has happened to you. Because it can take you out of your destiny. You know, it's, it's, it's like if you're single, you can be dating somebody. And all of a sudden, somebody doesn't want to have anything to do with you anymore. And you become offended at that. Now, it's amazing that you become offended with that. And, and again, it shows you how much of the flesh that we're operating in uh, concerning our own, our own lives. But you can become offended with that. And yet, at the same time, you're praying and saying, God, now, if this is your will, uh, but if it's not your will, I want them out. And then when they go out, you become offended Greatly hurt and greatly wounded, and God saying, "Hey, what's the deal here?" Now, I answered your prayer because I see what can happen down the road, and you can't, but I can, and I got somebody for you that you need. I went to the doctor this week just to get my annual checkup, you know, do the blood and all this stuff. And my doctor looked and he said, you know what, there's some things on your skin right there that I don't think we, let's, let's take them out. Let, let's, don't, let's don't let them get any bigger or anything. I'm sure everything is okay, but I want to check it, but let's just take them out. I said, okay, if you want to take them out, take them out. That's fine. So I went in the day for him to take them out. So He's talking to me, and he's getting ready to give me a shot. And um, he says, now, when I put this in, he said, the, the, the substance is going to go out into your body, and because it's not in a vein or anything, and, and where he said, it's, it's going to be painful, it's going to burn. And when a doctor tells you that, they have no idea what level of pain that's going to be. Because that's never happened to them. They're on the cutting end. We're on the receiving. And so, so he says, now you're going to feel it. Oh, boy. And then when he went that, woo, I mean, it felt like burning sensation going all through your body. And so he did it, and he said, okay. He said, I'm going to let that set. And he said, I'll be back in here in a few minutes. And I'm going, a few minutes? What? I'm sitting there going, why can't you give me Novocaine? Like they do at the dentist's office. Well, I don't feel anything whatsoever. And so he came back in in just a few minutes. And he said, now, he said, now and let me just tell you this. He said, uh, uh, I'm going to go deep. Because he said, it's not surface. He said, it's down in. He said, I'm going to go deep in there. And he said, I got I to get all of it out. And he said, so you're going to feel the scaffold. Could you explain that just a little bit? What do you mean I'm going to feel as if the drink is not as cold as you think it is? It's probably a little bit lukewarm. What do you mean you're going to feel this? He said, well, the deeper I go, he said, you're going to, you, you're going to know I'm cutting on you. You're going to feel it. Okay. And, and I have a high tolerance of pain level, so thank God for that. So I'm sitting there now, you know, I'm praying a lot more. I had no idea I was going to, I realized this is a great time to get a lot of prayer time in. So 
I'm sitting there, and sure enough, when he starts, I can feel it going in, and I can feel it going around, and I can feel the whole thing. And I'm like, okay. And so he gets it all out, and um, he doesn't sew it up or anything. He just takes, there's holes there like gunshot wounds. There's holes. They're deep holes. And I'm sitting there, I think he's going to sew it up. No, 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 he just puts some stuff on it and everything like that and puts, you know, some bandages on it. He said, okay, that's, that's great. He said, um, I'm going to give you some, um, uh, some, uh, some medicine for antibodies uh, to take for a few days. And he said, if, if, if there's any pain, just take a couple of Advils. No, no, no. There should be a thesis written by him to letting you know what's going to happen when you get it home and that little stuff that he swabbed around in there is now gone. Because when it was gone, I had three holes talking to me at the top of their lungs. Hey! <laughs> How are you? <laughs> it, I mean, it hurt. I mean, it was painful. Okay? So I'm sitting there, and then the next day when I get up, it is so sore. It is black and blue, red all around, everywhere, and it's painful. I can't hardly move on one side of my body. You know, I'm going, this is crazy. I want to itch it. I can't itch it. I can't touch it. I can't do anything to it. It is hurting. I'm in pain. I am sore. Get the picture? So, yesterday, my wife is going to go somewhere. And my son, Christopher, and his wife is celebrating their anniversary. They're going to go somewhere. So they're bringing my little grandbaby... Lily over to our house. So everything is fine. Tava's taking care of her. It's really great. It's wonderful. Uh, uh, then she says, Don't for, did, did you not forget that I have to be gone for about an hour and a half and you're going to have to take care of Lily while I'm gone. This is a three-year-old that absolutely, four years old, that has absolutely more energy than the ever ready bunny rabbit. Unbelievable. She got so much energy. She's running everywhere, having fun, doing all kinds of things. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her. And, uh, and then I get on the phone and I call Candace. And Candace comes over for a little bit. And I'm like, that's good. And then Candace says, I got to go too. And so Tava's telling me, she said, I'll only be gone for an hour and a half and I'll be back at a certain time and, uh, you, and just put on a video, it'll be fine, she'll be watching. I said, okay, that's really great, okay, that's really, really great, I'm hurting right now, I am in pain, I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? And so and then she starts looking at a movie, everything's fine. Then she gets up and she don't want to see the movie anymore, she comes and grabs my hand and she says, come on, Papa, let's go play. We want to do grocery store, we're going to go shopping and play in grocery store. And I'm telling you, she pulled my arm and I I'm like, oh, and, and so, and, and I'm going to have to get up, and I'm going to have to go play grocery store, and I go up and do it. The doctor told me I couldn't take a shower. I am feeling just, I just, you know what it is when you don't have a shower? You know, after, after a long period of time, and I'm sitting there, I'm feeling grungy and dirty, and I had not have a shower, and, and I got on my bathrobe, and here we go, and here we are, and playing grocery store and she's bossing me around and telling me what to do where to go and 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 I'm hurting I mean I wanted sympathy from my wife I wanted to I want I, I got self-pity all over me I just want somebody to stroke me by and say it's okay honey I'll call the ladies and tell them I can't go and I'll stay here with you and I'll take care of everything thank you dear no she did not do that she goes Candace goes. Everybody goes. But me, I'm there with her. So, 
an hour and a half. And I'm looking at the hour and a half. And it goes past the hour and a half. And Christopher and Kristen told me they'd be back at 6. It is 6. This is already going past 6. It's 7. It, the hour and a half is going on past. And I'm looking at the clock. And then Tava finally comes home. And when she comes home, I'm back there in the back of the house sitting up. I, I've, 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 I've got all these groceries around me. Lily's doing all this stuff. I'm having to do this. And then Tava walks in, and she takes her Instagram video. And starts videoing the whole thing that's going to go viral around the world. And now I am offended that she's taking this video. There, there. Thank you. Please don't be offended by me. Thank you. I forgive you. <laughs> Dang. Next time, be home at six. Um, so Taba is sitting there going through those. So I, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know all of this. I, she said, it's so cute. Look at this. It's so cute. And then I look on Instagram, and there it is. I have not washed my hair. I have not anything. I'm sitting there in the bathrobe. I look like, nah, I haven't shaved anything else. And this is everywhere. And she said, it's so cute. You didn't do it. Just to say, the Lord spoke to my heart. and He said, isn't this a great illustration for what you're preaching tomorrow? <laughs> now I'm offended at God. <laughs> I say all of that to say this. Offense is going to come. It's going to happen. It's impossible, Jesus said, that it does not come. Amen. We can sit and laugh at it when we hear it. But when it happens to us, it's not a laughing matter. We get upset. Listen to this. Jesus could have been offended at the disciples when they fell asleep, when he's getting ready to go to the cross. He could be major offended. But he didn't. He kept on with his mission. He kept on with what he was supposed to do. He could have been offended at the people and hated them that beat him to a pulp where you couldn't even tell that he was a human being. Laid his back, laid everything wide open. Listen to this. This is something that the Lord showed me that I had never seen before until this weekend. As I was sitting there meditating on this and studying, the Lord said, you remember... When I was in the garden, my disciples fell asleep. I could have been easily offended at them and carried that offense to the, to the cross. Mad and upset with them for what they did. But, he said, I could have been majorly offended at the people who beat me to pieces plucked out my beard, spit in my face, did all of these things to me, hung me on a cross where I was naked. He said, if I would have carried that and would have not forgiven them, listen to this, the fact that he forgave them proves that he was offended by what was taking place and happening. Remember that he was in the garden and he was so caught up with what he was getting ready to do. He said, Father, if there's any other way we can do this, take it away from me. I don't want to do it. For the first time in his life, he's facing self-preservation that is totally opposite of the will of God. He had to deal with it. He himself coming down into the garden realizing for the first time, I mean really realizing in the middle of it, of what was getting ready to happen to him, could almost be offended for the word that was given and the prophecy that was given and why he was sent on that mission. 
And he literally, he literally, because of what happened to him, he had to release that or he could not have been the perfect sacrifice. To continue his destiny, continue to fulfill what he needed to do, he had to forgive them because now he's facing what all these people have done to him. And he chose to say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Did you know there's a lot of people that hurt you and offend you and they have no idea that they just did it? We take it personally in our lives. So, think about David. King David. Think about when, when Samuel went to anoint Jesse's sons. God said, go anoint Jesse's sons. He went in and he looked, the first one, the elder brother, and said, this must be it. This, is, this has got to be the one. But just, now, now think about this, okay? Because w- once, once this message is out to you, you're going to be able to see a lot of things in the Word of God and see it in a different light. Think about this. Jesse had all of his sons there except for David. David was not even, David was not even invited to the anointing party. He was not even given consideration. So if anybody was going to get offended, you get offended if somebody didn't choose you. You get offended if somebody didn't invite you. So David, David, David could have got easily offended because he was not even invited. And Samuel turns around and says, do you have any other sons? And he said, well, we got that one. <laughs> He's out in the field right now, but him? He brought him in. And then the other thing is this. David did not get offended because he was not invited to the anointing party. He came, and in front of his brothers, he was anointed to be king in front of all of his brothers as the baby boy of the family. He was anointed and not a one of them was anointed. And we do know because of scripture after that, they were all offended at him. Isn't it amazing how God does this to test our hearts and to, and to look at us? He anointed him in front of everybody and then they had to deal with the offense. How do we know that? Because when we went on the battlefield, his older brother said, what have you come down here for? I know why you've come down here, the insolence of your heart, the way you're looking at things. And, and David turns to him and looks at his older brother and he said, and here's the key of knowing what David put up with all of his life with his brothers. He turns around and he says, what have I done now? Which is an indication that they were constantly on him about things, making fun of him, laughing at him, you know, just doing all kinds of crazy stuff to him. He said, what have I done now? Now, here's the key. What did Jesus do? Jesus forgave them. What did David do? This, this is the key, folks. And this is, by the way, David was not even under the new covenant. He was not even born again. He didn't have the Spirit of God on the inside of him. When his brother offended him and tried to take him out of the place where he was going, the Bible says David turned from him. He turned from him. Let me tell you this right now. You've got to turn from offense. You've got to turn from it and you've got to continue to go on. You have got to release and you have got to forgive. If you don't, it's going to cripple you. It's going to crush you. It's going to cause you to be destroyed. It's going to affect your body, your mental capacity, everything about you. It's going to affect. Because God said, when you, when, you, when you stand praying, forgive. Forgive those. There are times when people offend you in a certain way you, that God will have you to speak to them. Concerning that. And the Bible says if you, if, 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 you, if you have an offense with your brother, go to him and talk to him. Go to him. Sometimes that's not possible. So what do you do? Left to you, you forgive. You release. How can you do that? Only by the power of God. That's the only way you can do it. If Jesus can do it, you can do it. Only by the power of God. Don't destroy your life. Don't let what somebody else did to you dictate your future and your destiny.
when it comes up in your mind or you see them on the street, you know what, Tave and I made a decision a long time ago? Because I'm telling you when, you, got, you, when you're in ministry, you have people say all kinds of things about you and say things to you. And a lot of times we will see them at the mall or someplace else. And, and the funny thing is, we, are, we know what they've been saying about us, but they'll come up to us, Oh, gosh, Pastor, you're such a blessing. I love you so much. You know, and they're, of course their pants are on fire. You know that. You won't tell them that. But they'll come up, oh, Pastor, we love you so much. You're such a blessing. We just love you and Miss Tava, you know, and, and, and things. And you know what they've been saying. You know what, Tava and I made a decision a long time ago? We made a decision a long time ago that we will bless them and we will release them. I don't have time to talk about it. I got too much to do. Too many places to go. Too many people's lives to affect. I don't have time for that. I don't, I don't have time for offense to take me out of the ball game and fulfill my destiny. And the last thing I want to say to you is this. When people offend you, and you get so easily offended, traffic, everything else, people offend you. Just remember this, especially when they're strangers at times. You have no idea what they're going through. You know, when that waitress or waiter today may do something and may offend you, you have no idea, like Tave and I met this single mother one time, that a couple who just got out of church treated her, we were sitting right there watching this, treated her, that she, they were so mad because she, start, she forgot to do things. And the problem was, is that she was a single mother. And some things had happened in her life just recently. And her whole mind was just fried. And yet people in church were treating her because they didn't like... In, in, in other words, instead of sitting there saying, man, something's wrong. Wonder, wonder if something's wrong with this person. When, that, when those people left, they didn't even leave a tip. And she broke down and started crying right there at that table. And I called her over and, and uh, Tave and I started talking to her. And I looked at her and I said, what, what, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she said, oh, I got all these bills and I got all these things and all this stuff has happened to me and, I, and I, I forgot to do some things here and this couple got really mad at me and they didn't leave me a tip or anything like that and I don't know how I'm going to make it and I'm going to have it. And I looked at her and, and Tave and I both looked at her and said, listen, first of all, I want to tell you, God loves you. And I said, let me just tell you this. You tell me what their meal was. And Tave and I, I said, my wife and I, we're going to tip you we're going to take care of their tip. And I apologize to you because you know they just came out of church. And I apologize to you the way they acted because that's not the way most Christians act. And I said, we will take care of that. And she broke down and looked at us. She said, where's your church? <laughs> you know, and it was, it was so neat. But see, you don't know what may be going. I told, uh, after the second service, uh, first service, I told somebody that one day I was sitting in the stoplight and uh, it was right up at Cape Fear Valley Hospital. And, and, and the light turned green. And this car came whipping around out of the t left turn lane and just drove in front of me and almost hit my car and took off and went through the, the stoplight. And I'm sitting there going, this person is crazy. I can't believe they just did that. And then I saw him turn into the emergency lane. And I sit there and went, wow. Who knows? if there's a pregnant wife in the back seat or somebody just had a heart attack or what's going on. And here I am getting offended and getting mad and getting upset. Don't let offense be a burden and a rock around you so that it weights you down in your life. Listen, something happens. Don't go chase somebody. Forgive them. Don't let anger come. Sure, listen, people are going to offend you and you're going to get upset. But you know what the Bible says? Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Deal with it before you go to bed. Don't let it become a root of bitterness. Deal with it and release it and forgive them. Let it go. And here's the other thing. Somebody hurts you, remember what God said. God said, vengeance is mine. I'll deal with it. He's, and He will. You will get justice. God will deal with whatever needs to be dealt with if you will just allow Him to do it. But here's one thing you need to understand. God is also long-suffering. He will give them time to repent and get it right. And, and a lot of times we're like, hey, God, you, you're taking too long on this. I want to deal with this myself. You're taking too long. So when you get offended, if you can talk to somebody, talk to them. 
okay? But if not, if you get offended, release it. Forgive. Let it go. Don't let it stop you from achieving and accomplishing and going where God has for you to go. Do not let it stop the plan of God that He has for your life. Do not let it destroy your life. Release and forgive. And I know people can, and can sit here and say, I've been so wounded so deeply so many times and you, you have no idea. No, you don't have any idea what I've been through in my life. See? But the thing that I choose to do is I choose to release it to God and I choose to forgive. I choose not to hold on to offense. Even when, at times when Tave and I have something, I choose not to hold on to that because I know it will give an entryway to the devil into our marriage and into our family. It's not worth it. Don't hold on to offense. A lot of times when people are offended, especially in families and, and marriages and stuff, it's basically because you won't talk. You won't sit down and discuss things. So all of a sudden that offense builds. You're playing right into the devil's hands. It's exactly what he wants. Don't do that. Have communication. Talk. And when your spouse talks to you, don't get offended and get defensive. Where you're not going to listen. You get mad, get jump up and run off. That because of my ego, because of my pride. That right there, if you can't sit down and have a conversation without totally 100% defending yourself all the time or getting mad and upset, it shows you where you are concerning your spiritual walk, concerning the flesh. Because see, spiritual maturity has nothing to do with your biological age. It has everything to do with how you react and how you handle things in the spirit realm that is there, that happens. Amen? And if you pray every day and say, God, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me in this area. Help me to walk in love. Help me to say the right things, to do the right things. Help help me to handle offense. If you work out here in this world, which all of us do, if you're out here, you're going to be offended. It all depends on how you deal with it. Don't let it eat your lunch. Don't let it ruin your life. Don't let it ruin your marriage. Don't let it ruin your relationship uh, with, with, uh, uh, with your church. Don't let it ru- ruin your relationship with, uh, with, with your boss or your supervisor and everything. Start praying. Start praying for them. You have no idea what kind of pressure they're under. The reason they act and do and say the things that they do. You have no idea how they grew up or what happened to them in their life. But realize offense will come. It's going to happen. But then deal with it and release it. Pray over it. Let it go. Can you say amen?